Hello, uh, my name is uh, Paul Watson. I'm the founder of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, which is uh, actually a movement, an international movement to protect the world's oceans. We're primarily an interventionist organization. We're not a protest organization. What we do is intervene against illegal activities, uh, exploit marine wildlife and habitats. So therefore, what we are is an anti-poaching organization. We're also probably the largest uh, a non-governmental Navy in the world. We have nine ships that are operating uh, in different places around the world and um, with, with a great deal of success. So um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you uh, today. And uh, I guess how this works is if anybody has any questions, just feel free to post those questions. Um, right now we have uh, vessels uh, all over the world, like I said. Uh, we have um, two ships in the Southern Ocean that are pursuing the Japanese whaling fleet, that's the Ocean Warrior and the, um, and the Steve Irwin. We have the Bridge of Bardot operating in the Mediterranean, uh, retrieving uh, ghost nets. The Farley Moen and the, um, and the Sam Simon are in the Sea of Cortez, the Gulf of California, working with the Mexican Navy to protect the, uh, the, the endangered vaquita and the Totoba fish. We have the uh, Bob Barker, which is operating, doing anti-poaching work off of Gabon. And uh, just this, earlier this week, we launched our new vessel, the, uh, the John Paul de Jory. And that vessel right now is uh, doing a search and rescue operation because uh, the producer, director of Sharkwater, Rob Stewart, who's a very good friend of ours, uh, went missing on Tuesday. Um, we're Tuesday evening, and we've been doing a search with him all week so far, unfortunately, without running the up. And we also have a sailing vessel, which we do primarily for research activities, and that is uh, the Martin Sheen. Um, let me see, that's the first question. I have a large dolphin club, teach environmental at school, 3,100 of my students, met watch the curve every year, and we have worked uh, for all of us when we started the website. What else can we do to raise awareness and make a difference? I think that what we can do is uh, each and every day, what we need to uh, understand is that we're intimately linked to the ocean. The ocean is our life support system. Uh, if, the, um, you know, if the ocean dies, we die. That's the message that we're trying to get across. Uh, starting with uh, the smallest things in the ocean, phytoplankton. Since 1950, there's been a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the world and in the world's oceans. And phytoplankton provides between 70 and 80% of the oxygen that we breathe. So if phytoplankton populations collapse, we're in serious trouble. And it's really difficult time to get people to understand that connection. And one of the reasons that there's been a diminishment is because of the destruction of other life forms, because everything in the ocean is very intimately connected to everything else. Uh, for instance, one blue whale every day defecates three tons of whale manure or whale crap into the ocean, heavily rich with um, nitrogen and iron. And those are the primary nutrients for or a phytoplankton. So when you diminish whale populations, you cause diminishment of phytoplankton populations. In many ways, the whales are the farmers of the ocean. When you look at it that way. Uh, any other questions? But thank you for uh, for your support with what we're doing. Uh, we feel that uh, what we can do is uh, what we're trying to do here, which is revolutionary, is to ally ourselves as a non-government organization with uh, governments around the world. So. Uh, Right now, we have this partnership with the Mexican Navy. We have a partnership with the Galvanese Navy. We're a partnership with the police in Sicily and uh, a partnership with the Galapagos Park Rangers and the Ecuadorian uh, Federal Police, Environmental Police, uh, to protect those marine reserves there. And we're working on other alliances. What we can do is provide countries that don't have the assets with the volunteers and the equipment and the ships to uphold uh, international conservation laws in their waters. We also, of course, intervene in international waters, uh, like the Ocean Warrior and the, uh, and the Steve Irwin are doing now, pursuing the Japanese whaling fleet, which is illegally killing whales all along the coast of Antarctica. The Japanese whaling fleet has been condemned by the International Court of Justice, by the Australian Federal Court, and the International Whaling Commission. They're a criminal operation. And uh, we're, we've been intervening against them for all oh, since 2002. And, uh, the ships have been very effective in reducing their kill quotas from anywhere from 30% down to 10%. So they haven't taken more than 30% because of direct interventions by uh, Sea Shepherd crews in uh, opposing their illegal operations. And uh, I don't know how much longer that's going to go on, but as long as they're killing whales illegally, we will be intervening 
against uh, their operations. And what, you know, like I said, we had nine ships. Uh, we're always hoping to expand that, but the thing that people need to understand is that Sea Shepherd is no longer an organization. It's a movement. We have uh, chapters in about 40 different countries, so independent entities, but we all work in cooperation uh, to run the ships and to intervene. So, uh, any, I think this works on questions. I guess just got about one question so far. Um, the work in the uh, Gulf of Mexico is very interesting. The Vaquita, uh, scientists have determined there's only 30 of them left in the world. And our objective is to make sure that that species does not go extinct. I, you know, it's one of the, I think one of the most noblest things that anybody can do is to uh, intervene to prevent the extinction of an endangered species. The uh, Vaquita is the smallest and most endangered cetacean on the planet. It's being killed primarily because fishermen illegally are setting gill nets and long lines to capture the totoga fish, uh, which is also endangered. And the reason they're, they're so uh, desperate to get the totoga fish is because the bladders, the dried bladders of the totoga fish, is worth 20,000 US dollars in the Chinese market for some sort of voodoo snake oil remedy for God knows what. But uh, because of that price, there's a lot of uh, pressure to catch them, and the, and the uh, vaquita are caught in the nets and killed. Two years ago, there were 60 of them. Now there's 30. So the population has been cut in half. And uh, what we have to do is uh, intervene by seizing those nets and gill nets, which we've done. We've taken over 150 gill nets and long lines out of the Sea of Cortez. And of course, we've made a lot of enemies amongst uh, the uh, poachers down there, but that just goes with the, with the turf. And, uh, but we are, we don't carry arms or we're not armed, but we do have uh, armed. Uh, Mexican so sailors who are on board those ships are helping us out. We're working with them very closely. Um, what steps did uh, we take to go where we are today, and how did you come by the idea of Sea Shepherd? Uh, I was a co-founder of Greenpeace. I began in 1969. I was the youngest uh, uh, co-founder of that organization. It originally was called the Don't Make a Wave Committee. We changed the name to the Greenpeace Foundation in 1972. I was the uh, campaign leader for Greenpeace's can uh, operations against uh, the Canadian seal hunt. Uh, that was in 75 and 76. And uh, I left uh, Greenpeace in 1977 to set up this organization. And the reason I came by that name is because during my campaigns to protect seals in, for Greenpeace, I had written some articles uh, where we described the campaign as shepherds of the Labrador front because we were protecting these white baby seals, they were just like little lambs. And so when I started my own organization, uh, we named our first ship to Sea Shepherd and we took the organization, or the name of Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, meaning that we're here to shepherd lives uh, in the ocean. So it, that was the name we came up with at the time. And I think, I think it's a good name. It really conveys the fact that we were there to protect and, and to, to defend. And uh, all about 20 years into that, people started calling us pirates because we were intervening against so many of these illegal operations. So my reaction to that was, well, if you're not going to call us pirates, well, we'll be pirates. So we, uh, we uh, designed our own uh, Jolly Roger. And uh, it, what that signifies is the black signifies extinction, the skull saying that humanity is responsible, the yin-yang symbol of the dolphin and the whale uh, means that harmony can be found in the ocean. We can learn from the whales and other life forms of the ocean. And of course, underneath is the cross shepherd staff and the um, and the trident, which means aggressive nonviolence. And that's what we practice, is aggressive nonviolence. Well, we're 40 years old this year, and during those four decades, we've not caused a single injury to a single person, nor have we sustained any serious injuries to our crew. And we're proud of that nonviolent record. People say that while well, you're violent because you destroy uh, equipment and we sink ships, yes. But uh, I personally look on the destruction of a, any equipment that is used to take life as uh, an act of nonviolence. If a man is about to shoot an elephant and uh, he's a poacher and you pull the rifle from his hand and destroy the rifle, to me that's an act of nonviolence. You're saving life. Life must always take precedent over material objects. So, um, gotta keep watching for questions down here, I don't know, <laughs> below. Uh, so what, we, what we're uh, doing in other places, for example, um, in the last uh, year, we found a Chinese drift net fleet on the Indian Ocean. We were using drift nets, which have been out of sites since 1992. And crew fully documented that operation and then began the pursuit of the drift net fleet back to China. 
Uh, when we entered those disputed islands in the South China Sea, we ran into the Chinese Navy, yes, and the fishermen said, we're being chased by pirates, you need to help us. So the Chinese Navy got on the radio with us and they said, uh, what's this all about? We explained it, said we had evidence of their illegal activities. And the Chinese Navy said, okay, bring them in. So we entered the Chinese port, presented the evidence, and uh, three of those captains were fined $300,000 and lost their licenses uh, for life. And uh, all six vessels were, were shut down. And uh, the Chinese took our evidence seriously and they uh, responded. So we were, we were quite happy about that. Um, next question. I've contacted the chapter in Dallas a few times, but I haven't got a response. Is there another office I can contact? Yes, please uh, just contact our office in Los Angeles and they'll uh, you know, guide you to, to the people who are, uh, who are responsible in, in, in that area. We, we do have chapters all over, all over the United States. We have chapters all over the world. And uh, we're really, it's a volunteer movement. We encourage people to volunteer both on the ships and both on land. And uh, the reason for that, we've kept the organization primarily volunteer. About 90% of our crew are volunteer. Sometimes we have to hire people for technical positions that we can't get volunteers for. But the reason we keep it as a volunteer organization is because of the passion of volunteers. You cannot pay people to do what our volunteers have done over the years. So that kind of passion cannot be purchased. So we're, you know, that's why we encourage this uh, movement to be a movement of volunteers, to give everybody an opportunity to understand that they can intervene and they can change the world. Everybody has that opportunity. And a lot of people who've been with um, Sea Shepherd have gone on to start their own organizations. For instance, Alex Pacheco who was 19 years old when he joined me in 1979. And he went on to found People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Uh, and other organizations have been founded by people who understood that by getting involved with Sea Shepherd, they could learn things on how to make a difference themselves. And to give you an idea of how that works, back oh, way back in 1982, I got a, a call from a man in Scotland, in Glasgow, and he said, you know, they're killing gray seals up here in the Orkney Islands. What are you going to do about it? And my response to him was, I'm on the west coast of North America. You're in Scotland. What are you going to do about it? So we helped them set up a Sea Shepherd group. They organized a campaign. They intervened against the sealers. They made up so much publicity that we were able to raise enough money to buy the island they were killing the seals on. And today, that is a seal sanctuary. That was basically all of that was done by one man saying, uh, you know, what can I do? And we've given him the guidance that he could, in fact, do anything. And each and every one of us has a, a capability uh, of doing that. Uh, yeah, we, a brave person here, you feel scared. No, actually, I don't, and I'll tell you why, and I'm not bragging about this, is that I learned a, I learned a lesson back in 1973 when I was um, a volunteer as a medic for the American Indian Movement during the occupation of Wounded in South Dakota. And we were surrounded by about 3,000 federal troops from various agencies shooting at us, about 20,000 rounds a night into the village. And I went up to Russell Means and Dennis Banks, they were the leaders of the American Indian Movement at the time. And I said to, to Russell, I said, uh, you know, we don't have a chance of winning here. Uh, we're surrounded. We cannot possibly win this battle. And uh, Russell said to me, well, look, we're not here because we're going to, we're, because we're concerned about whether we're going to win or, we're, or lose. We're not here because of the overwhelming odds against us. We're not concerned about that. We're here because it's the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. And uh, yes, it's risky, and, uh, but this is what, where we have to be. When people say, well, you're fighting a losing cause, I think it was Martin Sheen who told me losing causes are the only causes really worth fighting for. And it's a miracle, really, about how many times we can actually win these so-called losing causes. So, but what I also learned from Wounded Knee is all summed up in the Lakota word, uh, the words, hokahe, it's a good day, day to die. If you're prepared to risk your life to protect an endangered species, that's a very, very noble thing. And when I asked people, I said, are you prepared to risk your life to protect a whale? Some people think that's you know, going too far. I say, no, uh, you know, we ask young people to risk their lives to protect real estate and oil wells and fight in the name of religion or patriotism. I think it is uh, just as noble as an endeavor, probably more noble to risk your life to make this a better world for tomorrow, to protect endangered species and endangered habitats. So our other campaigns last year was that we, um, we two years ago, and one that uh, has been featured quite a bit in the media is that uh, we, you know, for 10 years, the, um, the Patagonia and Antarctic drift net fleets, these poachers were operating in the Southern Ocean. 
They were put on the Interpol purple list. Everybody knew these were criminal operations. One of them, the Thunder, the most notorious of all, had, had probably profited by 100 million euros for what they were looting from the South, Southern Ocean. But the problem is most of the world is under international, inter international waters. And even though there are international laws, there's a lack of economic and political motivation to hold those laws. So for 10 years, nobody did anything about these real pirates that were down there plundering our ocean. So we decided to go after them. We sent two ships to Sam Simon and, uh, and the, uh, Bob Barker. And uh, we found them. And uh, when we found the first one, the Thunder, he dropped his nets and ran. Bob Barker pursued him. It became the longest uh, pursuit of a poacher in maritime history, 110 days from the coast of Antarctica all the way up to San Tomé on the equator on the west coast of Africa. Now, the net they dropped was retrieved by the uh, Sam Simon. It was 72, mi 72 kilometers long, weighed 70 tons. It took the crew 200 hours to pull that net in, and it was full of dead fish and dead animals and that. But we've taken that net and uh, loaded it, and then the Sam Simon jo uh, joined that pursuit. Uh, that pursuit ended in San Tomé when the Thunder had no place to run, uh, so the captain of the vessel sank his own ship right in front of us, about 180 miles off the coast of San Tomé. Uh, we rescued the crew, and the reason he sank it was to destroy the evidence of his illegal activities. But as the ship was sinking, four of our crew boarded the Thunder and were able to get the evidence, computers, laptops, or samples of the fish that were taken, and then, the, then it was sank. Uh, the captain and the two officers uh, were tried uh, for sinking their vessel in San Tomé waters and um, were given prison sentence. The captain got three years and the two officers got two years. The company that owned that ship was fined 17 million euros in Spain in the civil court. But unfortunately, when it got to the criminal court just last week, uh, they acquitted them because they said that Spain had no authority over waters outside of Spanish territory. And that's the real problem that we have in the world today, is that we have people who are pirating, plundering, uh, uh, you know, fish and other resources outside of, uh, of their territorial waters. It's like the Wild West out there, and anybody seems to be able to do whatever they want. And uh, we're one of the few organizations that intervene against those high seas uh, criminal operations. Uh, ever have to fight with actual pirates? Well, we fight with pirates all the time because, in our view, uh, poachers are pirates, and we have been shot at. We've had we've been had concussion grenades thrown at us. Uh, our ships have been rammed. Of course, we've rammed other ships. We've had uh, high pressure water hose fights with the Japanese fleet. Uh, there's, yes, there's many dangerous situations that are involved in. It. Those are the real pirates. There, nobody has a real understanding of what piracy is today. To us, piracy these are the people who are illegally exploiting resources. We often hear about the pirates of Somalia, for example. Those guys aren't pirates. They're fishermen who are driven into poverty by the real pirates, the Asian and the European um, drift net fleets or gill net fleets, uh, the trawlers that plunder their waters, they illegally took all of their resources and forced these people into a situation where their only means of survival was piracy. Uh, you're going to see in the coming years pirate, those kind of piracy operations emerging out of Mauritania and Senegal and, uh, and the Congo, because again, the foreign fleets are in those waters, plundering those waters with their resources. That's the reason Sea Shepherd has dedicated our vessels to protecting the waters of San Tomé and uh, Gabon and soon to be other places like Senegal and Liberia. And we're also looking at protecting uh, the, the fishing off of the coast of Tanzania and Kenya. So we're getting a lot of cooperation from African nations on that, and that's, and that's a very promising development because it's always difficult to work your way through, through the bureaucracy of these countries because the reason so many of these illegal operations continue is because of corruption and bureaucracy that allows them to continue. So we're trying to do the best we can there. Um, like I said, we've been shot at, we've had concussions in eight, so we've been a lot of confrontations, but we've never had anybody seriously injured, and we certainly have never injured anybody uh, in the process. And that's a record that we fully intend to, to keep. We don't carry arms on board, but we do carry uh, defensive uh, weapons, of, so to speak, like stink bombs, which is a uh, butyric acid, which is really rotten butter acid, and uh, you can clear the deck of a ship pretty fast with a liter bottle of butyric acid thrown on the deck. It's a horrendous smell, and uh, the forces everybody off the deck and inside to get away from the smell. Uh, when the Japanese use long-range um, uh, 
where the sonic devices against us is high frequency sound or low frequency sounds that uh, really uh, you know, shatter your eardrums, really, uh, and of course give you a headache. Uh, we responded by getting our own LRAD and turning it on them. We just had to use it once and they no longer use theirs against us. Actually, one of the funniest things we ever did is I got these uh, fake crocodile eggs uh, from Australia. They weren't real crocodile eggs, they were toys. But uh, we threw them on the deck, and as soon as they got wet, they suddenly sprang out of them these styrofoam pink crocodiles. And that just completely was great psychological warfare against the Japanese bears. They just thought the worst was going to happen. They had no idea, but they all stopped doing what we're doing because we hit them with the, these fake crocodile eggs. But again, these are things that we try to instill humor in what we do, but uh, and use effective uh, defensive mechanisms which won't, are designed not to injure anybody. Um, we read about the shark uh, expert that has gone missing. I know he was a previous Sea Shepherd as well. As any update on a safe return? Unfortunately, no. On Tuesday at five o'clock uh, in the evening, uh, Rod Stewart, Rob Stewart and uh, another diver were diving on a wreck called the Queen of uh, Nassau, and uh, this was near Alligator Reef in uh, in Florida. And they had been diving with reed breathers to a depth of 285 feet. And the problem with reed breathers is that uh, they can be dangerous. And both men came to the surface. One of them, as he got into the boat, passed out. They took their eyes off of Rob for just a few minutes, or half a minute, if not more. And when they turned, he was gone. And he must have passed out himself. So I, I fear knowing that that kind of technology, what can go wrong, is that he didn't survive. Right now, we're in the process of trying to find him. And because of the five knot current uh, of the Gulf Stream, uh, he could be anywhere up to 100. 80 miles from where he went missing. So was, uh, the United States Coast Guard has set up a, an intensive search program, and our vessel, the John Paul Gregoria, is, uh, is participating in that search program. Rob was uh, a friend, and also he, an incredible and courageous conservationist and filmmaker. He made the film uh, Shark Water, which changed the perception of sharks around the world uh, to, towards tens of millions of people. Uh, and uh, he made the film Revolution. He was working on the film Sharkwater 2 uh, when he disappeared. And uh, he had been working on that for the last couple of years. He was passionate about sharks. And uh, one thing he actually said to me, he says, there's a lot of danger in doing what we're doing here, from the weather, from the sea, from, uh, from the technology we're using. But the one thing that he said I'm, I'm not concerned about is being killed by a shark. And uh, his, his relationships with sharks and the filming work were just absolutely incredible. Uh, one of the things our crews have learned over the years is that sharks are not the monsters everybody has been taught to, to say that they are. Every year, yes, about five people are killed by sharks. We kill 75 to 80 million of them. And the sharks that are usually, that attack and kill people usually are by mistake. And primarily it's surfers because underneath the surface, a surfer looks like a seal and that that's what the, uh, the shark is moving against. And usually it's a, a bite, which can be fatal, but it's not an intended victim. When people say, well, you know, that's, you know, any human life is uh, unacceptable, I have to say that it's actually safer to go surfing, safer to dive than it is to play in golf. Because every year more people die from bee stings and lightning strikes on golf courses than people die from swimming with sharks. So there's really no cause to fear sharks. Yes, accidents happen, but they're not the monsters that everybody thinks that they uh, have been taught to say that they are. Um, are there any nations that you feel are doing a good job, or any policies that you feel are effective? There are some nations, uh, you know, the nations that we're partnered with. Mexico's trying to do everything it can to protect the uh, vaquita. Gabon is really concerned about stopping poaching in their waters, uh, and other nations are too. Indonesia has a policy that if they catch any foreign uh, uh, poachers, they immediately sink their ships. I think they've sunk well over 100 of them right now. We chased one of them, the uh, poaching vessel, uh, the Viking, we chased it into the waters, turned it over to the Indonesian Navy, and within one week, the Indonesian Minister of Fisheries had blow, blew it up. Uh, now, we're not really supportive of uh, blowing up ships in sea, and because it, you know, unless they're cleaned up, but, you know, that's what the government there is doing, and they have no control over it. But they do put these guys out of operation. They're sending a very strong message that their illegal activities are not going to be tolerated. And so we're, um, you know, so we are trying more and more to work with as many governments as we can. And as the situation deteriorates in our world's oceans, there's more uh, of a readiness by many of these governments to to actually look to unite with us to solve these problems. 
when we went after the and shut down the uh, Patagonian Antarctic sea fish poachers, they uh, we were actually uh, complimented by the former Secretary of State John Kerry, who said that uh, efforts like this are are going to be absolutely necessary if we're going to protect protect our oceans. Um, let's see. Well, where am I speaking from today? We're speaking from New York City. I uh, arrived yesterday from Miami, where we had dispatched the uh, John Paul Vidoria to do the search for Rob Stewart, and I'm here for uh, a couple of days and then go back home to Vermont. And um, right now we have four ships that are out on the ocean. There's about 150 volunteers on those ships from about 25 different nations and other ships. Uh, we have nine ships in total, and the ones that aren't out on the sea are being prepared for campaigns. And uh, so it's a very active fleet. It's active all the time. And um, in each and every one of these campaigns is, uh, are, are, very, are becoming very, very effective. So we're quite proud of uh, the people that we have, our captains, our officers, our crew members. Uh, they're doing this uh, passionately. They're doing it uh, because they believe that uh, it's, ha it's making a difference. And it, it gives them a really a great deal of uh, satisfaction to know that they've intervened to actually save the life of a whale or a dolphin or, or sharks or even fish and that. And uh, for example, last year, I think we, uh, we cut a number of whales out of uh, gill nets, both in the Sea of Cortez and off the coast of Africa. Also, we've saved a, a number of whale sharks, other sharks from those nets. And uh, th th this hands-on experience, I think, is very valuable in, uh, in, in making people understand that they have the power to make a difference. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions here. And um, our other campaigns, oh, for instance, the uh, 70 tons of uh, gill net, this uh, plastic gill net, that uh, nylon gill net that we took out of the Southern Ocean, that was turned over to Adidas and they are presently making uh, shoes out of that. And we're working in alliance with a group called Parley for the Oceans. And what we're doing is collecting plastic from beaches all over the world. And this plastic is then being recycled. Uh, so, one of the big threats to survival of uh, life in our seas is plastic pollution. It's going to be a point very soon there will be more plastic in the ocean than there are fish. So, what Sea Shepherd's working is to, is to recover plastic from beaches, recover plastic from the sea, find alternatives for plastic. For instance, we're working with a company in France that is making um, these materials out of seaweed. So, actually what you have is a, a plastic cup or a plastic toothbrush or whatever that uh, actually will break down on, in seawater and it literally becomes fish food because it's the sea. And so the, these are the kind of alternative things that we're trying to, to do. Sea Shepherd does a lot of research uh, where we worked in the Gulf of Mexico to uh, study the toxic levels in sperm whales caused by the Deepwater Horizon spill. Uh, last year, we also were doing research on whales off the west coast of, uh, of uh, Mexico. And uh, so the, our vessel, the sailing vessel, Mark Machine, is the one that's primarily involved with those kind of research uh, studies. And so that because of that, we're making a lot of uh, alliances with uh, the scientific community, too, because we believe that research is very important, but really the main emphasis of Sea Shepherd is enforcement uh, against illegal activities. And do we try to save all marine, not just specific species? Yes, we do. We, we, work, we work on campaigns ranging from phytoplankton to the great whales. Uh, we have campaigns in the Galapagos trying to save sea cucumbers uh, and lobsters in addition to sharks. Um, one of the, I think, the most important thing that uh, we can address really is, as I mentioned earlier, phytoplankton and zooplankton. This is a foundation, a basis for all life in the ocean. And uh, so therefore, we're, we're working on campaigns there. Norway and Japan are working on plans to uh, mass harvest, as they say, uh, krill or, or zooplankton from the ocean and for the purpose of making a protein paste to feed to, uh, to domestic animals. And uh, not many people are aware that 40% of all of the fish taken from the sea is rendered into fish meal, which is fed to chickens and to um, pigs, uh, domestic uh, raised salmon, uh, fur farms, these kind of things. And uh, of course, uh, one of the things that people also don't think about is that, you know, when fishermen say, well, we've got to control the seals because the seals are eating all the fish. The fact is, is if you want more fish, you need more seals because those, there's an intimate relationship between fish and marine mammals. Uh, and when you think about it, domestic house cats around the world eat 2.8 million tons of fish every year, which is more fish than is consumed by all of the seals in the North Atlantic Ocean. 
So we, we really got to get our priorities straight on, on that. I was raised in a fishing village in Eastern Canada. And because of what I know of what's happening with, with fish populations around the world, I don't eat fish. I have not for many, many years uh, because I've seen that steady decline. What we need is at least a 50 year moratorium on all commercial fishing operations to give the ocean a chance to recover. Because if we don't, by 2048, according to Dr. Boris Worm or Dr. Uh, Daniel Pauly, both of the leading experts on this, by 2048, there will be no fishing industry because there simply will not be any fish. And as I say all the time, if the fish die, the ocean dies, the ocean dies, we all die. I guess the best way to look at this is look at it from the Earth as a spaceship, which is what it is. We're a spaceship on this incredible voyage around the the Milky Way galaxy. It takes us 250 million years to do one orbit of the Milky Way galaxy, even at the speeds of the planet and the sun and everything are traveling. But on every spaceship, what we have is a life support system. And that means uh, this life support system provides the food we eat, uh, regulates the temperature, and uh, controls uh, you know, the climate, and uh, provides the oxygen that we breathe. And that's exactly what the ocean is, a life support system. And that life support system is run by a crew, and that's a crew of Earthlings, and not including us. Human beings tend to be passengers. We're on this planet having a great time entertaining ourselves. But what we're doing is killing off the crew that actually run the life support machinery. And by diminishing those crew members, we're making that machinery, which is our life support system, weaker and weaker and weaker. And if it collapses, well, we're in serious trouble. And if anybody denies climate change, they're an idiot. We have seen the effects of climate change around the world wherever we've gone and you simply cannot uh, deny what's right there in front of our eyes and it's also the opinion of 97 percent of the world scientists on this that this is a reality the other three percent have a vested interest working for different fossil fuel companies or whatever but the fact is is climate change is a reality it's causing higher acidity in our oceans uh, and it's leading to a lot of destructive patterns uh, changing water currents changing salinity in the sea and uh, it's a major threat to that life support system. Uh, why don't we just cycle over to seaweed made items is one question. Uh, yes, we can, but we also have to be very careful that by removing seaweed, we're also causing problems too, because seaweed is very essential for healthy fish populations, uh, especially kelp forests and things like this. Uh, so all of these things are interlinked. So yes, uh, seaweed can be utilized uh, for that, but Really what you have, what it comes down to is uh, 7.5 billion people. Uh, there's simply not, not enough resources in the ocean to continue to support that population, which is growing and growing and growing. And at some point there will be a crash on that. There are three basic laws of ecology. The first is the law of diversity. The strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon the diversity of species within it. The second is the law of interdependence, that all of those species are interdependent with each other. And the third is the law of finite resources. There's a limit to growth, a limit to carrying capacity. And what we're doing is stealing the carrying capacity from other species. And that diminishes both interdependence and diversity. And uh, the, these are the laws of ecology that we're, in, that we're violating each and every day. And for us to survive as a species on this planet, we have to take a completely different perspective, observe the laws of ecology, and look at the world from a biocentric point of view. Unfortunately, most of, most of humanity uh, takes a look at the world from an anthropocentric view, which places human beings in the middle of everything. We're all powerful, we're all dominant, it's all here for our use. A biocentric point of view, which is a position held by indigenous peoples around the world, for example, is that we are part of this and that we all need each other, all species need each other to survive. We cannot live on this planet by ourselves. We need these species and I think the relationship is extremely important to our survival. Uh, see. Do you believe we are closer to ending the illegal hunting of whales that when they first started the sea ship? Well, we are actually, uh, we have reduced the number of whales that are being killed every year. Uh, Japan, Norway, and Iceland are the only nations that are involved in uh, whaling right now, and we're gonna keep the pressure on them. Um, but yes, there has been a significant reduction on that, and hopefully, but what we also need to do is see a significant reduction on fish and, other, and seabirds and other creatures which are essential for our survival. Uh, Deb says, I spent my life on the Great Lakes. My father took us for uh, camping trips on our boat. I was just thinking about everything my dad had to know to be on the Great Lakes and wondered if you were uh, in the waters as a kid. How do you become a captain? 
Uh, yes, uh, I, I was raised in a fishing village in eastern Canada, right on the border of Maine and New Brunswick. And um, I uh, joined the Canadian Coast Guard uh, when I was uh, 18 and I worked for a few years uh, on board Norwegian and Swedish merchant vessels. And when we founded uh, Green Cruise back in uh, 71 was the first Green Cruise Voyages. Uh, I was first officer on all the Green Cruise Voyages from 71 until 77 when I left. And then I've been captain on vessels, uh, Sea Shepherd vessels uh, from, well, from 1978 onward. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, all of our crew, what we have, we have volunteers who have no sea experience at all, but we always make sure that we have uh, the officers have experience and uh, they come from all different backgrounds. For instance, I've had navigators who were not sailors, but they were, one was an, she was an astrophysicist uh, from the Jet Propulsion Lab in, uh, in Pasadena, and that she's certainly qualified to navigate. So we've had a mathematics professor uh, uh, on board, and they, again, are very qualified to navigate and people from all different backgrounds. Uh, there are certain skills that we really have to hire people for, like helicopter pilots, although we have had volunteer helicopter pilots. We also have um, chief engineers and, and various disciplines like that. But for the most part, everybody is a, is a volunteer and very, very, and guided more by passion than anything. Um, what do you think is the best route to go in saving salmon here in the Northwest? Well, the best, way, the best thing you can do with saving salmon is to shut down those salmon farms, which are highly destructive. Uh, they're, you know, spreading parasites and viruses to well salmon populations. And uh, the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans, for example, uh, is really not doing its job to protect well salmon populations or protecting the interests of these salmon farm companies. Uh, domestic raised salmon, of course, is uh, pretty much the main source of salmon in restaurants and stores these days. It's not a very healthy uh, thing to eat. Uh, the, to raise a domestic salmon, you have to, has to be antibiotic intensive, hormone intensive, because the crowding conditions of these salmon farms uh, cause diseases. Those diseases, those viruses, those parasites are then spread to wild salmon populations outside. Another thing that many people are aware of is that, uh, you know, a, a salmon raised on a salmon farm is a dirty white flesh, and that's not going to be very uh, appetizing to people who consume salmon. So what they do is they, uh, they dye the, uh, the meat of a fish while it's still alive by putting dye in their food pellets. The reason that wild salmon have a pinky flesh is that they feed primarily on uh, krill or like shrimp-like creatures, and uh, that, that actually is a natural way of coloring their, the meat uh, pinkish. But on salmon farms, you don't get that. And uh, the other thing about salmon farms is that to raise one salmon on a salmon farm takes about the capture of at least 70 fish out of the ocean to to put into the pellets that they, the fish meal that they feed to them. So it's certainly not helping to preserve fish in our oceans. What we need to do is, for, is to, to restore the health of our rivers and creeks and everything that are going into the ocean. Uh, that will encourage well salmon spawns, which we've wiped out a great many of those spawning areas. And we have to get rid of the salmon farms and bring back the wild salmon. Uh, the salmon to uh, Northwest indigenous people is as sacred as the buffalo was to the people on the plains, and that's why Sea Shepherd has gotten a, a good alliance with, uh, with the uh, peoples along the indigenous peoples, the First Nations peoples along uh, British Columbia, Alaska, and places. Uh, sea Shepherd has been very close to uh, indigenous peoples for many times. We were the only ships in the world that fly the flag of the, of the Six Nations, which is given to us by the Mohawks, uh, because they understand that we understand that we don't do anything in our lives unless we take into account the consequences of our actions on all future generations of all species. And uh, so we're very, very proud of our affiliation with the, uh, with the uh, Air Force Nation. Uh, let's see. Can you talk about the benefits of the drawbacks of your Whale Wars TV show? Do you know what the demographics was for your viewers economically? Did it assist? Yes, it did, because of the, we live in a media culture. That means that uh, the media defines reality. If it's not on camera, it didn't happen. Uh, so what Whale Wars was able to do was to bring what we were doing in the Southern Ocean uh, to into the living rooms of millions of people around the world. That certainly gave us a, a boost in support, but it also made it real as to what's going on out there. And, uh, you know, how that came about is that but back in 2005, <coughs> excuse me, I, um, I went to all the different networks and I said, look, you know, there's a show on Discovery. The biggest show on Discovery is about a bunch of men going into the Bering Sea, into very rough and hostile waters, uh, risking their lives to catch crabs. I said, I can give you men and women.
from all over the world, going into even more hostile waters, rougher waters uh, down in off the coast of Antarctica with the purpose of saving whales. That's got to be more interesting than every week just catching a bunch of crabs. And so Animal Planet went with it, and that was the origin of the show. Uh, we are now working with Discovery. We're working with uh, Paul Allen and Robert Redford to do more shows. Uh, recently, we did the Ocean Warrior series on Discovery. That's now going to be aired in about 100 different nations uh, within the next few months. And uh, we'll also be returning with Whale Wars uh, because the campaign is just going down in the Southern Ocean right now. And we hope to uh, extend that because really our biggest weapon, our most powerful weapon is the camera. And uh, you can do more to change the world with a camera than you can with a gun, and we really believe that. Uh, are salmon farms genetically modified? There is genetic modification of salmon. Uh, we call all those fish the frankenfish. They are uh, they grow twice as big in half the time, and uh, there's something seriously wrong with that. Uh, so. What we're, what, we're, what we're seeing right now is an attempt by some governments and by the industry to replace wild salmon populations with completely domestically raised salmon. Now, they could, I guess, raise salmon outside of the marine environment, say in tanks, but again, that's very costly. Uh, but really, I think that the, what we have to look at is a moratorium. People have simply got to stop eating fish for some time. Uh, you know, back about for hundreds of years, the shaman in Polynesia, they would they had this thing called this word called taboo, and the origin of the word taboo was that these were laws that were passed, and uh, one of them was that if they take a bay, for example, and they would say this bay is taboo, which means that for at least 20 years nobody fishes in this bay, and if any Polynesian person was found fishing in that bay, the penalty was death. They killed them. And people said, well, that's awful. Stream, but when, but the Polynesians understood one thing: the survival of the fish meant their own survival. If the fish died, they died, and therefore they took it very, very seriously. The problem we have today is there are no taboo areas in the world. Everything is under attack. Everything is being overexploited. There are no taboo areas in the world. Everything is under attack. Everything is being overexploited, and uh, we've already reduced many of these species, especially sharks, down to ninety percent of their original. And we doesn't take much time. During World War One and World War Two, there was a rebound in populations, and that was just in you know six to seven years. I think that if we instilled a 50-year moratorium and banned all commercial fishing, that is all heavy gear technology, long lines and uh, drift nets and gill nets and all of these things, that the ocean could recover to what it was before these incredible exploitive uh, industries came into, into being. But the problem that we have is that it's all about short-term investment for short-term gain. And there's a thing which I call the economics of extinction. People are making money by driving species into extinction. For instance, with the PETA, they're making money because they're going after the, 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 the bladders of the totoba, and of course they're driving the totoba extinct. But take a look at bluefin tuna fisheries, for example. Mitsubishi and other companies in Japan, they have warehouses that are full of bluefin tuna, frozen. Uh, a 10 to 15 year supply. They don't have to catch these fish every year. They could go 15 years without catching fish. That would allow the bluefin tuna to recover. But why don't they do that? Because as the fish become more diminished, the product that they have in their warehouses becomes more valuable. So this is an investment in extinction. Diminishment translates into scarcity, which translates into demand, which trans translates into higher prices. So uh, one bluefin tuna, just one fish is worth today, on average, in Japan, 75,000 US dollars. Sometimes fish go for over a million dollars because they want to keep those fish scarce. They, and if they go extinct, well, they're 10 to 15 years supply, they'll set their own prices, they become a priceless commodity. Same thing you're doing with elephant ivory, storing it in vaults, investing in the extinction of the elephant, because when the elephant becomes extinct, the ivory that's in the, in the vaults becomes incredibly expensive. And it's this kind of attitude which is destroying our planet. Uh, what is your most memorable encounter? Well, um, that encounter was the one that actually changed my life uh, quite dramatically. It was back in 1975. We were chasing down the Soviet whaling fleet, and we found them off the coast of uh, Mendocino, California, about 80 miles off the coast, just before the 200 mile limit. And, uh, we had come up with this idea that I was with Greenpeace at the time. We came up with this idea that we could stop the whalers by we were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time, 
all we have to do is get between the harpoon and the whales and, uh, and that uh, they'll start killing whales. And so Robert Hunter and I were in a small inflatable boat in front of a Soviet harpoon vessel was bearing down on us at full speed and in front of us were eight incredible sperm whales that were fleeing for their life and every time the harpoon would try to get a shot I would block their path with our small little boat and that worked for about 25 minutes until the captain came down the catwalk and screamed into the ear of the harpooner then he looked at us looked down at us smiled and brought his finger across his throat like that and that's when I realized Gandhi wasn't going to do much for us that day and uh, a few moments later this horrendous explosion the harpoon went over our head slammed into the backside of one of the the whales in the pod, it was a female whale. She screamed, rolled on her side, blood everywhere, and suddenly the largest whale in that pod slapped the water with his tail and disappeared. He dove right underneath of us and threw himself out of the water at the bow of the Soviet vessel. But they were ready for him with an unattached harpoon, and he pulled the trigger, hit the whale point blank in the head. The whale fell back in the water, screaming in agony, blood everywhere. And I was only about 100 meters from him, and suddenly, he saw me. He saw me. I saw his eye. I was looking into his eye, and he dove. And I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming straight towards us real fast. And he came up and out of that water at an angle so that the next move was to fall right down on top of us and crush us. And as his head rose out of the water, I looked into that eye so close that I could see my own reflection in his eye. And what I saw there was understanding. That whale understood what we were trying to do because the next move he made was to pull himself back. And instead of collapsing on top of us, he slid back into the sea. I saw that his eye disappear beneath the surface, and he died. He could have killed me and chose not to do so. I'm personally indebted for the fact, to that whale for the fact that I'm still alive. But I saw something else in that eye. And what I saw was pity, not for himself, but for us, that we could kill without so recklessly, without so mercilessly. And for why? Why were they killing sperm whales? As I sat in the middle of the Russian whaling fleet, I thought about that question because they didn't eat sperm whales. They used the whale oil, it's highly heat resistant oil, one of the best oils in the world. And uh, they were really sought out for the construction and production of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said, here we are, killing this incredibly beautiful, self-aware, sentient, socially complex creature. And for what? To make a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it struck me. We are insane, ecologically insane. If we're going to survive. We have to turn this around. So what I do, I do for them. I don't do it for us, although we will benefit, but I'm motivated by them. So in 1986, when we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet on a holdout moratorium, uh, I was confronted by other conservations. One of them came up to me and said, just want to let you know that what you did in Iceland is inexcusable, uh, and we don't support it. And I said, so? You think I care? They said, well, you should know what people think about what you're doing out there. And I said, didn't sink those whale whaling ships for you or any other human being. We sank those whaling ships for the whales. You find me one whale that disagreed with what we did that day, and I promise you, we're not going to do it again. Um, let me see. Will small cetaceans ever be protected on the International Whaling Commission? I wish that they could. It's very, very difficult. The International Whaling Commission was established in 1946, primarily by the whaling industry, because they realized they were wiping out the resource that they were making money on. So it was set up by the, the whaling industries for prof, you know, to, for their own profit, their own vested interest. So it was never meant to protect all cetaceans. Uh, Monaco has moved uh, that uh, whaling come under the United Nations, and we certainly support that, that, that measure. But uh, what we have been able to do beginning in 1980 was to turn the International Whaling Commission, get enough votes to turn it into a conservation group, uh, more than a whaling group. And that's been quite successful with the moratorium, which was launched uh, getting a more common commercial whaling, which began in 1987. We have tried, of course, to uh, get small cetaceans uh, covered under that, but uh, the Japanese and their allies, Norway, and Iceland, and Denmark, have fought that tooth and nail to keep that from happening. So it's, uh, there is no international body that uh, oversees the protection of small cetaceans, unfortunately. Uh, What's it? Uh, how can we make the moratorium happen? The moratorium is in place. The problem is, is enforcement, as it is with everything. Enforcement is always the problem. Governments lack the economic and political will to enforce international conservation law. And uh, also, they have incredibly large um, PR machines. So well, those of us who are trying to work for conservation are, of course, uh, labeled as terrorists or uh, or pirates or criminals, even though we haven't been convicted of any crimes. 
You know, there's a thing called the Inter Interpol Red List. And the Interpol Red List was set up to capture uh, serial killers and war criminals. I'm the only person in the history of that list to be put on there by Japan for the charge of conspiracy to board a whaling ship. Didn't even board it, but I was charged with conspiracy to board a whaling ship, and I'm now on the Interpol whaling list. What Japan thought that they could do is stop me. If they stopped me, they could stop Sea Shepherd. But that hasn't worked at all because Sea Shepherd is not. Sea Shepherd is not an organization. Sea Shepherd is a movement. And we have a lot of captains and a lot of crew, and we have a lot of supporters around the world, and that's what Sea Shepherd is. Sea Shepherd will certainly survive myself and uh, is quite capable of being effective without my involvement. And that's something I, I'm really happy to, to know because I, it's, we're not going to die. Because, you know, you can stop an individual, you can stop a movement. But, I mean, you can stop an organization, but you can't stop a movement. It's an idea, you can't stop it. And so I'm very happy. In many ways, uh, Japan putting me on that list and making it impossible for me to travel has been uh, a positive thing because uh, it has allowed Sea Shepherd to grow and evolve as, a, as an effective movement. Uh, with the current U.S. administration, what is the most important action to take in order to help? The most important action to take is probably to wait four years to see if anything changes because this is certainly not a friendly uh, is not a friendly administration when it comes to conservation. Uh, but we'll, we'll see where that, where that takes us. Ironically, China is actually moving into a position of leadership in conservation and then, uh, on, on, in marine matters. And of course, Europe and other places like that. But uh, we can try, of course, and we do have contacts trying to work with the US government on this, but I'm afraid we're entering into the the dark ages in, in many respects as far as conservation is concerned. But I'm always positive about these things and I think that uh, we will reemerge and, uh, and we will take action. All of humanity will take action when they see that what is going on uh, with our environment, especially our oceanic environment, is going to directly influence their life and the chance of their survival. And when people say to me, well, how can you be so positive about things? I just take a look at the history of extinctions on this planet. There's been five major extinction events in the history of the Earth. 62 million years ago, we had the meteor, meteor which destroyed the dinosaurs. Uh, the Permian uh, extinction 250 million years ago wiped out 90% of everything on the planet that was alive. Uh, yet, it's, it recovered. It takes 18 to 20 million years to recover from a major extinction event. So I'm always, I always say to myself, 18 to 20 million years from now, it's going to be a really nice planet again. But until then, we have to do everything we can to protect as many species as we can and uh, make this world a better world for tomorrow, for all species, not just the human species. And the only way that's going to be done, the only way that we're going to be able to survive is to understand that we have to look at reality in a different light. We have to look at a new paradigm, one which understands that we're part of all of life on this planet, that we're not dominant, and we have to learn to live within that context. I've been criticized because I've said things like worms and bees and fish are more important than people. And people say, oh, that's outrageous. How can you say that? Worms are more important than people. My answer to that is this, simple. Worms and bees and trees and fish can live here quite happily without us. But we can't survive without them. That makes them ecologically far more important than we are. We need them. They don't need us. And uh, that's a, a realization that we have to get through to people all around the world that we need diversity, we need interdependence, and we need to be cognizant of what we're doing to destroy that interdependence and that, and that diversity. Uh, and someone says, how can we support, uh, you can support Sea Shepherd um, in many ways, by being a shore volunteer, by being a supporter, by being a crew on the ship. But what you really can do is get involved uh, with issues near and dear to your heart. If something you're passionate about, go for it. You know, for instance, Dr. David Wingate, one man in Bermuda, because of him, the Bermuda storm petrel, a small bird uh, that you probably never heard of, but it, it would be extinct if it was not for him. Uh, because of Diane Fossey, the mountain gorillas of Rwanda are still there. Uh, on the work of people like uh, Jane Goodall and so many, many others who have made a difference. Uh, Rob Stewart, who, you know, he's, who we're searching for right now, has made a difference in people's understanding of, of the importance of having sharks in our ocean, the fact that the shark is molded evolution in the ocean for 400 million years, apex predator, and the very important part of that diversity. So each and every one of us has that ability to make people aware, to make a significant change 
and to, to fight for the future. And I, I think we have to look at what kind of world is this going to be 500 years from now? You know, we might not see the children who were born 500 million years ago, but they're going to be there. And they're going to look back and they're not going to be, they're going to condemn us, our generations, for if they've lost all of this. And uh, so it's really a choice. Do we want to be uh, heroes to uh, future generations or do we want to be demons, those who destroy? You know, the um, Kayapo and Yanomani peoples of uh, Amazon, they have a word for people from so-called developed societies. Call them the termite people. They're gobbling up everything and leaving nothing behind but waste. And therefore, we have to change that, that kind of, uh, of an attitude. Uh, yes, of course, you can use uh, any of the quotes uh, on that. Uh, so feel free to, to do that. Um, and just remember that, uh, and which is what I try to tell, especially young, young people all the time, don't be disheartened at that, the fact that right, people telling you you can't do this, that you can't make a difference. You can't. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Don't be dependent upon governments or big institutions or corporations to solve any of these problems. As Margaret Mead, the famed anthropologist, once said, they've never solved any problems. Governments cause problems. It's up to us to, uh, to solve these problems. We have to be the solution. We can't leave it to organizations or governments or corporations to solve problems. It goes against their vested interests. You have to approach this with feelings of love and passion, compassion. And the three virtues that I try to encourage in each and every person who comes on board as a volunteer is courage, imagination, and passion. A combination of those three things is what is needed uh, to change this world for the better. And uh, I know it's still got four minutes. Any other questions? And uh, oh, Sea Shepherd's 40 years old this year, so we're celebrating our 40th anniversary in. Uh, Los Angeles in May, May 20th, if anybody's around then. And uh, we're hoping to have uh, uh, more campaigns uh, that are coming up and uh, getting stronger because the stronger we get, the more effective we can become. And the more people involved, the more effective we can become. So we certainly encourage each and every person who has the uh, interest to get involved. And uh, we will encourage them and train them in every which way that we can. And uh, any other questions? Uh, if you accomplished one thing in 2017, what would it be? Well, it's unfortunately, uh, there's too many things to accomplish. All of these things work uh, together. If I could accomplish one thing, I guess, would, if I could, if the Sea Shepherd could, and all of us could end whaling, that to me would be the best thing we could accomplish. But, uh, you know, it's going to be a difficult thing to do. We're trying to stop the dolphin slaughters in Japan, the killing of pilot whales in Denmark, the overfishing of tuna in the Mediterranean. Uh, so we're trying to address all of these things. So there really isn't just one thing, and we're hoping to make progress on each and every one of those things that we're, that we're addressing. Uh, and can young people join a version? Young people can. I mean, you, you, if you're 18, you can apply to be a crew member. Uh, and of course, if you're younger than 18, you can certainly be involved as a shore volunteer. And uh, so the youngest crew members that we can take by law are 18. But we have had crew members who've been 80. The oldest crew member had, was 86 years old. So there is no age restrictions. There's no restrictions based on anything else. I mean, our captains are both men and women from all different countries. Sid Chakravarti is from India. Uh, Peter Hammerstedt is from Sweden. Uh, Adam Meyerson is from the United States. Uh, Una Leo is from uh, France. Uh, so there's a, you know, it's truly an international global movement. And we're really proud of the fact that, that, that it is. Uh, Junior Sea Shepherds, it's a good idea if anybody uh, wants to actually organize that, they certainly can get in touch with us uh, to, to do so, because really the future is uh, younger people. And uh, I actually believe that through the last 50 years of my life, I've actually seen that younger people today are far more involved, far, far more interested than uh, you know they were back when I was younger. 1972, nobody even knew what the word ecology meant. Uh, well, people know that awareness has increased. Now what we've got to get is for people to care, not just to be aware, but to care, and to care passionately about what kind of future that we're leaving to future generations. And I think we're out of time right now, so thank you very, very much for, for this time, and uh, all the best to each and every one of you for the future. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.